All right, thanks very much. Uh, and glad to wrap it up also here. <laughs> uh, so thanks again for the, um, the invitation to come here to talk uh, a bit about some of the state of the art for artificial intelligence and also uh, how it blends together with the, uh, the PAC system. See, there's a delay. All right, so uh, these are my disclosures. Okay, um, if we look at the uh, the FDA website, uh, we can very easily follow uh, the trend and uh, the growth of the uh, AI algorithms in medicine, uh, many of which happen in radiology. And if we were to plot this, uh, you can see how this curve is really exponentially increasing. Um, so there's a huge impact um, in our field. And if we look at the uh, RSNA conference, uh, only a few years, years ago in 2016, um, in that upper right-hand corner, there was really not even much of a uh, mention about machine learning or artificial intelligence. And by the time we get to 2017 uh, through 19, there's quite a lot of growth. Uh, in 2017, you see that uh, there's a number of uh, AI companies that start to show up. Um, by 2018, there are 83 companies that are presenting at RSNA. Um, and at that time was called the Machine Learning Pavilion, uh, after which from 2019, um, moving forward, it was called the AI Showcase, uh, where we had 130 companies. And um, later in 2021, uh, there was a bit of a consolidation as we saw a lot of AI companies uh, either just go away and disappear, or they start to partner together and, and consolidate with other AI companies. Um, and so we had 99 third-party AI companies uh, for that year um, demoing over at RSNA. And when we look at last year, uh, there were over 200 companies. So this is again growing. Um, and the trend that, uh, the theme that I saw was how um, it quickly moved to talking about integration uh, rather than just having your one-off AI algorithm by itself. Uh, but how does this actually interact uh, with your PAC system? How does it interact with the entire workflow for the radiologist? And for this year, uh, so far, uh, we have just under 100 companies, uh, but I'm pretty sure this is, number is going to go up as we move towards um, the uh, RSNA later this year. And if we look at how uh, these AI algorithms um, connect with the PAC system, uh, I could really generalizably um, categorize into these, these categories. So some of these, they really actually don't interact with all with the PAC uh, software. Others uh, that I would call a tier zero, uh, these are able to display the results uh, in the PAC software. Uh, oftentimes this shows up as a new study series a tier one. Uh, this is something where um, you've got some sort of button uh, within your PAC system that you can uh, launch to start up another application. Um, and oftentimes this could, could even be uh, a hyperlink uh, to an external piece of software essentially. Tier two, there's much tighter integration um, and there's also a way for uh, the AI to provide uh, feedback uh, as well. And at tier three, uh, there's um, bi-directional functionality, and uh, that's what I would call the highest level of integration. And for these tiers, a lot of them are really driven by, in part, um, how they are used in the clinical environment. Uh, so some of them, for example, are used to prioritize cases. Uh, take, for example, for intracranial hemorrhage, uh, you want to make sure that these patients are going to be seen uh, immediately, urgently, uh, because they have a very time-sensitive event that needs medical attention. Um, others could include um, AI that's being used for screening purposes. Um, so, for example, with um, lung nodule um, detection. Uh, there are also others that are an aid to diagnosis, whether it's a second opinion or it's an incidental finding. And there's also others that uh, are used to help uh, reduce complexity and to improve the workflow for the radiologist. Another way to look at this is uh, a, work a workflow-based approach. 
so this is how you would interact with the AI. Uh, some of them are always on, so they're always uh, in that background. Uh, waiting for, let's say, a study ingest of a particular uh, modality with a certain study description. And upon its receipt, then it will uh, run the inference. There are also other AI that uh, would be pre-ordered. And also there's AI that uh, is happening more or less on demand. So the radiologist at that time would decide, okay, I need a little bit more information. And so I'm gonna click a certain button to trigger that AI to run. So I'm gonna give two examples. Um, one is something that uh, uh, is commercially available. Uh, another is something that we're doing in research. Uh, both of these are uh, done in partnership with Yale University here. Um, both of them are also what I would call the, the tier two AI integration, um, and they help with the diagnosis. Uh, the first one with the breast density, uh, this is a always on AI, so it's always running in the background. And for the second one, this is a uh, on-demand AI, so you're gonna trigger it to activate. So for the, the visage breast density um, uh, AI, this is a uh, joint project that we did together uh, with Yale University. Um, so we trained the AI algorithm um, on over 33,000 uh, mammograms from Yale. Uh, the breast imaging radiologists here provided the uh, ground truth annotations. Um, and the goal really is to be able to provide um, a automated uh, breast density classification. Um, and if you followed some of the, the recent news from the FDA, uh, there's a, of course, the, um, the recommendation to have the breast density information uh, be required um, for Connecticut State that's been there for a number of years already, but really wanting to make that push to make this universal for the entire country. And breast density, uh, it's important. Uh, it's an important biomarker in the sense of, uh, depending on the density level, that can actually drive uh, additional follow-on imaging for the patient. Um, and so uh, what I want to highlight here is that uh, we were able to achieve, um, to obtain the FDA clearance in a very short time period, uh, all during the middle of the pandemic in just nine months. Um, and we had a lot of um, scientific uh, touch points there as well in terms of how we performed uh, the testing and validation and also the transparency um, of how we went forth about that. Uh, most notably is that for this AI algorithm, it's been uh, in full clinical production um, at Yale uh, since April 2021, and it runs on every single mammogram that comes in. Uh, we did a, a post-deployment analysis where we showed a very high level of agreement, and this is going to be presented at the American Wrench and Ray Society meeting uh, that's happening next month. So for this AI algorithm, um, it uh, runs in the background. Uh, it waits for the study ingest of the mammogram. And as soon as that becomes available, uh, the inference runs and it leverages the, the GPUs, the render servers for Visage. Um, and what this allows for is that um, by the time the radiologist opens up the study, that inference result, it's already there, right? So you don't have to wait for uh, the inference to actually calculate. So this is what it looks like. Um, you literally just click one button. At Yale, it actually opens up automatically. Um, it shows the breadth density. Uh, and importantly here, in addition to having the density classifications and the confidence interval uh, of the AI prediction, um, it also allows user input. So should the radiologist decide that uh, this is a different classification, uh, the radiologist can simply select a different category um, and that information is recorded. Um, and that's important for uh, post-deployment follow-up. Uh, let's say one wants to see if there's any sort of shifts or trends, uh, we have that information. Uh, the next thing we looked at was, uh, this is some work that we actually did with, uh, with Qi um, and it's looking into uh, denoising pet images. Um, and what I want to highlight here is that uh, we were able to leverage some of the innate abilities of Visage and um, having a very open architecture where it allows for dockerization 
um, of your AI algorithm. So it made it super easy um, to have Cheese algorithm plug directly into Visage um, and then to leverage um, the custom hanging protocols and layouts uh, so that the display of a pre and post denoise image can be uh, really easily vis uh, visible and presented to the radiologist. So this is the uh, the walkthrough, um, and we're just opening up uh, a standard PET CT image, um, but to clear away some of the the additional text and. Um, we're gonna go ahead and execute that AI inference. Um, and this is running on a research instance of the PAX, which literally it's a computer that's just one floor above us in this building. Um, the actual inference time uh, here takes about 40 to 50 seconds. And bear in mind uh, with this research system, it's only got one GPU that's about five years old. Um, now imagine in the actual clinical deployment, this could, for example, leverage an entire bank of GPUs and also uh, the inference could run uh, upon study ingest, just like the breast density. So on the left-hand side of the screen, the left-hand panel, that's the original um, PET-CT. On the right-hand side, uh, that's the uh, denoised uh, set of images. And because we're able to leverage the hanging protocols and the layouts uh, within Visage, then it can automatically register the data sets for you. And so in this example here with a MIP, uh, as you rotate and move around uh, one set of images, the other set will track as well. Uh, importantly too, is that um, one is able to place uh, an ROI uh, to make measurements um, on one side of the image. And again, because things are registered, you're able to uh, take that same ROI and place it in the exact same position uh, as the denoise image. Um, so this is just uh, another example on the research side of things to show um, how um, it's so easy to take uh, those AI algorithms and just plop it right into Visage uh, for, uh, for use. Okay, so with this, um, this blends into uh, the interoper interoperability. Um, and so, there are AI inference alg um, algorithms that affect the work list, right? So this is the cue for the radiologist to uh, look into which images, uh, which studies to look at first. Um, and especially when you consider how, uh, if one were able to take the, um, the prediction uh, result of an AI algorithm and plug that into another AI algorithm, uh, that'd be really cool. Um, and so take, for example, um, having um, AI algorithms uh, for body composition, where you're passing certain pieces of information of a whole body uh, organ segmentation into another uh, to calculate the composition of it. And um, imagine you have now different AI companies doing this, right? Um, and so in terms of the interoperability, um, one of the ways that uh, the RSNA is promoting this is through the uh, Imaging AI in Practice, the IAIP. Um, and uh, it's really leveraging a lot of the, the standards, um, everything like DICOM, HL7, uh, and lexicons as well, in order for uh, disparate pieces of data around AI to be able to talk to each other. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's a growing list of participants uh, uh, for RSNA and this uh, IAIP. And this is one of the um, uh, the workflows that they have where uh, if you have a chance, visit that website over at RSNA uh, where it literally walks through um, a imaginative uh, scenario of a patient coming in uh, with a certain uh, order and they need to walk through the various steps within the hospital system um, and how uh, their data uh, goes from everything from the modality to uh, the PAC system where AI fits in, um, and eventually that goes to the reporting system. Um, it also speaks to um, some of the things that happen on the uh, after uh, the imaging, so everything from the data analytics on the hospital side, and especially for the uh, the health system, uh, and of course including uh, into that is the uh, the research aspects as well. 
So with these sort of things, um, a little bit more of the recent years, there's been a, a, a large growth towards um, shifting uh, to the cloud. Um, and a lot of this has been driven by everything from improved performance to uh, better security. Uh, there's cost savings. Uh, a fair amount of this was driven by the pandemic as well to have the ability for remote reading and also for supply chain issues that uh, cloud can overcome. And within the, uh, the aspect of uh, AI integrations, um, a lot of the third-party AI companies, uh, the way that they operate or deploy um, their algorithms um, to date is uh, you would need to have a physical box uh, that's at the hospital. Uh, and so within that box, data goes in to get it de-identified. It gets then shipped off uh, to their cloud server for inference, comes back to the hospital for re-identification and reassociation uh, with that patient jacket. Uh, so it's a lot of skips and hops. Um, and furthermore, uh, for the hospital IT staff, it's another box that they have to deal with. Now, imagine uh, all that in a very deeply embedded uh, system uh, can be in the cloud, right? And so now you're able to actually consolidate uh, all these pieces of hardware, software, and also contracts uh, into something that uh, is under one umbrella. And so this can really help to streamline that entire process. One of our recent studies, we looked into uh, the computational requirements for uh, performing segmentation of some of the common structures of the brain. Um, and one of the things that we found was how for a 3D based um, deep learning approach, uh, it requires a lot more memory uh, to process that inference. Um, and so imagine now scaling that up where you have not only multiple patients in a hospital health system, uh, where it's hitting that inference all at the same time, uh, but also you may have multiple AI algorithms in your hospital all running at the same time. Um, and so uh, this speaks to the further uh, advantage of having a system in the cloud that can really leverage things at scale. So I uh, want to summarize here and, and how pa PAX uh, plays a very central role uh, in radiology. Um, the use of AI, it can help in many, many ways throughout the hospital system uh, for the radiologist and for the patient. Um, that the work that we do here, uh, it's highly multidisciplinary in nature uh, and also how um, cloud packs can really help leverage the IT resources um, in terms of its uh, peak performance um, when it's at scale. Thank you. One question. Okay, let me ask one question. I, I'm curious for, for the sites that already start the visit, right? How easy is it for them to use this denoising algorithm that you guys already uh, deployed on visit at uh, Yale? Yeah, so um, on, the, uh, on the technical aspect of it, um, it's literally taking that one Docker container and plugging it right in, you know, assuming you've got all of your IRB OKs. Um, I can speak, uh, let's say for the visage breast density, when uh, we did the validation over at NYU, uh, that's what we did. Uh, we validated here at Yale first, and we took that one container and plopped it over uh, at NYU to uh, run an external validation cohort. Uh, so super straightforward. Your, your GPU is in a non computer. Um, the, the interface is easy to install, but you have to point out to that GPU, right? At least you need to recompile uh -huh. your, your, your interface every time you install a new place because you may use different GPU resources. Um, so the um, the way that it can leverage those render servers um, on, on our end, it's literally just plug and play like that. Yeah. So super easy. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.